And with that, I will hand things over to Tanya so she can introduce our speakers. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Rensselaer Plateau Alliance Speaker Series. And tonight's topic, Northeastern Bats. I'm Tanya Isa, board member with the RPA. And I wanna thank you for spending part of your evening with us tonight. It is my great pleasure to introduce our speakers this evening. Emily Davis and Mark Warner have worked with the New York State DEC on bat counts for many years. They've both worked as technicians for private companies studying bats and gating caves to protect the bats that hibernate there. In addition, they are office managers for the Northeast Bat Working Group, all while running Spelio Books, a full service book and gift shop for cavers, bat scientists, and bat enthusiasts. Along with attending bat research and caving conventions all over the world for many years, Emily and Mike have supported and worked with Bat Conservation International, which is an organization created to end bat extinction worldwide and to create a positive public image for bats. Tonight, they are going to discuss where bats are found, how they are studied, as well as the ongoing crisis of white nose syndrome. Welcome, Emily and Mike, and we're looking forward to hearing from you. Good evening. Um, give us one moment because we have to connect the phone to the laptop to get our pictures up. We'll take just a couple of seconds. Um, we're very lucky to, mm. to be able to uh, work with bats. Hold on. Okay. Let me try again. Okay. Worked two days ago. Yeah. It's worked before. It'll work again. Give us a second. <clears throat> no problem. There we go. Everybody see that? Yes, it's there. Good. Good. So I guess without further ado, we'll uh, roll right into this talk. This this is a fresh talk for us. We've just been preparing it over the last uh, week or two. Uh, so this is uh, this you're, you're, we're trying trying something new out on you. So. We've worked with bats, well, I've worked with bats since 1983 and Mike since the early 90s. We're very lucky to be able to work with bats. Um, and in New York, that means working with two different kinds of bats. We have a, three species of woodland or tree bats. Now, I doubt that any of you will ever see these or at least know you're seeing them. You may see them flying above your homes uh, or in a woodland, but they're extremely rare to see. We have the hoary bat, which is a beautiful bat and really quite large. We have the um, red bats who are a beautiful color. Um, sadly, I once caught one on a antenna of a car. Uh, that's the only time I've ever seen a red bat up close. Um, was when we ended up catching one by mistake. And then there are silver hair bats who live largely under tree bark in the woodlands in the Northeast. Um, these bats are, are really quite beautiful. As I said, you won't see them very often. They don't go into caves. They're rare in houses or barns. And it's the other types of species, the migrating bats, we have the, the what, what we jokingly call the uh, snowbird bats. Um, and there are six species of those in New York State. Yeah, hibernating. And these are hibernating bats. Sorry, the, the first group are the migrating. Uh, the second group are the hibernating. And I mean, look at that cute face. How can you not love that cute face? So this is a northern bat. 
And that's that's the long ear bat. And that's the long ear bat. And if you look, there's a. Let me see. I think we can use the the pointer on here. Uh, that thing right there is called a tragus. And one of the ways that you tell your northern bats is when you look them in the face, when you take them out of a, a net when you're catching them, they have that pointy little thing called a tragus. It helps direct the sound in their ear. And the other bats in our area do not have that. And this, this one actually was a little brown bat. Mike had them out of order when yes. I was doing it. Yep. so. There we go, Northern, and, and Indiana. these are Indianas. Um, Indianas are now, used to be recovering really well in New York State until the early 2000s. Um, now it's rare. I don't think that they've found any in the last four or five years. Uh, the tricolor, which historically has been known as the Eastern Pipistrel. And if you look at the very red wing bones, that's one of the ways you can tell them when you when they're hanging in a cave. And then we have one of the two most common, well, what used to be the two most common, but this is now the most common, the big brown bats. They're the ones that end up in people's attics and barns um, and can be an annoyance. And there they are in our barn. Um, we have a wonderful little maternity colony. You'll see the pink baby, right? there that's an infant and we found those in our barn a few years ago um, and now keep that side of the barn pretty much closed off all summer to allow the bats to raise their young in that section of the barn roof see that ear very well there that does not have the big tragus like a northern longer bat um, and then we have the um, small footed bat. And it has, if you look, there's a different shape ear and a different shape nose on that one. Some of these are a little difficult to tell apart unless you handle a lot of them. Um, but eventually you, you catch, catch them and they're sort of keys to how to check. I mean, the Northern long ear, you can also take the ear and fold it over it. If it'll touch the nose, then you know it's a, northern long ear. Okay, no. Now, how do we study and protect bats? Well, first, we do an awful lot of meeting and sharing of information. Uh, there are two organizations we work with. One is the Northeast Bat Working Group, um, and we were fortunate enough to hold the uh, the annual meeting for that in Saratoga Springs uh, right before COVID shut us down. And it was the largest group that had met in the Northeast um, in all the years of the organization. Uh, it, the organization started out with about 12 or 15 people. And 25 years later, we had 200 people at the current meeting. Um, and it's a, a combination of federal folks, uh, state, different state employees, um, contract employees, and academics, really wide range group. Um, and there are poster sessions um, and formal presentations. So there's our, there's our group from this year, not a crispy picture, but it was 200 folks way, way up from when we started. Now, there's also a national group. The North American Society for Bat Research is 51 years old. Um, and we have met in the Northeast um, a couple of times. We had a meeting in Albany in 2014 with about 400 people. That was people from all over the country. It tends to be heavier in academics than the Northeast Bat Working Group. There also uh, is an international bat group. Uh, that is a group that has met in Costa Rica, Brazil. Um, I think the most recent meeting was in Thailand and our next meeting will be next summer in Austin, Texas. Now, 
of course, there's an, an enormous amount of publication material. This is a, a Springer Verlag, which is one of the top academic publishers in the world. And last year they published a 50 years of bat research um, publication tied to the Northeast, I mean, so the National um, Sim Society. And you mentioned uh, Tom Coons right here from the Northeast. Yeah, Tom Coons was a, a researcher out of Boston who did more publications than anybody I've ever seen um, until he had a, a very serious accident some years ago. Now, what we can do with this is, how do you report all the material if you don't do the field work? So here we are, field work, different types, and this is the New York State DEC crew with me doing a monitoring roost count in the middle of winter. Um, one of the things we do to help protect the bats is the Northeastern Cave Conservancy and the National Speleological Society do not allow visitation uh, in the recommended time periods that the uh, federal government gives, which is in this area, October 1st to May 1st. But every other year we survey a variety of caves to see whether or not we have had uh, an increase, decrease, um, or no change in the bat populations. And there you see um, a little brown bat on the ceiling. Actually, that may have been the tricolor. Mm -hmm. We did find one tricolor in Clarksville Cave during the last survey, and it was pretty much the only tricolor we had seen in several years in Northeastern caves. Um, we also do mist netting. Now, mist netting uh, is a system where you set up a series of poles, which always have to be tied to the roof of the car, and do a variety of work with the bats. You catch the bats, and we have these survey tables where we have lights, measuring equipment, scales for weighing them, etc. So here's a mist net. Um, you take an area where there's a flyway. Um, bats, like all the rest of us, prefer to travel on paths, or in this case, fly on paths that are open through the woodland. It's easier for them, for them to go from one place to another. So these nets are set up pretty high. And you set them up during the day, drop them down until dusk. Uh, that's so you don't catch too many birds that you have to help release. And then at dusk, you set them back up again and catch our little friends. So then we take them out of the nets and we use gloved hands. Nowadays, we also are masked uh, because bats are mammals and they're actually very close in metabolism and a variety of other characteristics with human beings. So we don't know whether they can, our Northeastern bats can catch COVID. So we are masked with the bats. Um, we don't wanna pass on any, on any germs from our hands. So we are plastic gloved. We will measure the wings, uh, look through the joint of the end of the ring where their thumb is. Um, that's actually a bat's thumb right there. These are his fingers. And we'll look at that joint right there because if it is partially see-through or the joint is the bones have not um, matched up, it means it's a juvenile. So you can tell whether it's a juvenile or adult, even if it's in the fall when it's full size. Uh, we then weigh them. Uh, we may either tag them or um, glue on a transmitter. Uh, and then we can follow them if we glue on a transmitter. And in fact, in some times of year, you can even inject a transmitter under the skin. It depends on where you are, uh, what species of bat it is, whether you can do that. So here we have all of our gear, three in the morning, taking everything down and putting it away. And the next day, you're following the bats with the transmitter on it um, with telemetry work, and you are trying to find out where their roosts are. 
Um, if you know where their roosts are, you can protect them better. And this often has to do with uh, tree roosts or whether or not they're in somebody's house attic. So we follow them using this telemetry work and it, it makes beepy noises. They're also um, acoustic monitoring with stands and devices that are set up in woodlands. This will record the calls of the bats. And today's equipment has become so detailed that you can actually tell with these calls what species it is. Uh, very technical work. Um, here's a setup that it was set up for probably about a week or 10 days. It has a solar collector so that the system can be on every night and continue as long as we have sunshine during the day. You can get data for an entire week or two or three days, depending on what your survey is. Uh, some of this is done for a pipeline or other environmental studies and will study in farms, woodlands, marshes, wide range of areas to see what kind of bat populations we have and what species are there. Um, here we are on the edge of a farmland. So this was a, an example. There was a, this is a pipeline um, plan. And so survey work had to be done to see whether or not there was going to be major disturbance of the bats if the pipeline went through this area. Now, another method of studying the bats is a drive-by acoustical transit. Here, the acoustical equipment is mounted on the roof of the car, and they drive a certain area at night and can pick up the bats' calls as they drive. I think it's at about 15 miles an hour. Yeah, tops. Tops 10 to 15 miles an hour to catch the sounds of the bats. A lot of this has been done around the Thatcher Park area and throughout New York State. Um, another method of using to, uh, to catch the bats and to do survey work is what's known as a harp trap. This is a harp trap. It's covered again to keep the, the birds out of it before dark. Um, but it has a series of strings that are vertical in two parallel layers. So the bats sort of swoop to one side to avoid the, the strings and then bump into the next set and then drop from the strings, which are under this cloth, down into this catch net below. And we'll show you a, a dark picture of that in a minute. Yep. This is in Vermont at Aeolus Cave. We, we scooted out of New York slightly, but this is a major hibernaculum of um, tens of thousands of bats. Now this next picture shows the, the um the environment that you use a heart trap in, you notice it's much less surface, surface area and it is used at the mouth of caves or other places where you know there are going to be lots and lots of bats in a concentrated area. And you can see the harp strings up and down right here. And I'm reaching into the pocket to reach out bats. And you'll notice in my hand is a paper bag. We take the bats out put them in the paper bag, roll up the top, and write on the side the time that we took the bat out, um, whether it's male or female, uh, and then it's taken to the study table. Here I am carrying a big handful of bat bags up from the cave entrance. There's the study area. They have glued trackers onto the bats, put them back in the paper bags, put a new time on it so that they know how long to let the glue dry, and then they release them. Here we are, you can see the, the little tracker being glued onto the back of the bat. Again, they're weighed, they're that, measured. That one is banding. And that one, oh yes, there's banding, but there's that night we were doing both banding and trackers. Emily and Mike, the so came up earlier how do the bats handle this, this? How do they respond to this human handling? They actually don't mind that much. If you're used to it and you hold them firmly, but with a gentle hand, they don't really fuss much um, and they don't really mind. I think one thing to keep in mind 
is that bats are incredibly social animals and are used to being in contact. I mean, obviously with other bats is less alarming than a human being, but, um, and they do object to being grabbed as anyone would, but if you hold them gently, they, they relax and they look around. Uh, we've actually, not in the Northeast, but in, in Brazil, we were netting bats. And because you're taking them out of their feeding cycle, you actually want to give them uh, ripe bananas and, you know, you can actually just feed them feed before them. you release them. They hang around and feed, then they go do their own thing. So as far as wild animals go, they, they're pretty amenable to the handling. And if you're careful, it doesn't affect them at all. Uh, some species are feistier than others, of course, but it goes right. pretty well. We're talking about 1,425 species in the world. So they act differently. Um, but the bats that we capture here tend to be not terribly upset by being handled briefly. And when you check with nets, you don't want to leave them in the netting too long. You check like every 15 minutes. And uh, sometimes you find them there just taking a nap, hanging out, barely attached to the net, but just sort of chilling till their problems go away. But when we show up, eventually they do. So let's see. Uh, gates. All right. So gates. Let me find where I am here. Okay. So we we have used gates gates are a sort of a um last last option um because changing the environment of the cave is something we we would rather not do but in certain areas and certain caves um or certain mines there's enough visitation that it can disturb the bats terribly uh, this is hale's cave in thatcher park um, we gated Hale's Cave four years ago, five years ago. Well, actually, it was 2013, right after. Oh, okay, yeah. seven years, eight years ago. Yeah. Um, uh, my how time flies. Well, so we gated it uh, because Hale's, they wanted to open up one of the trails that had been closed for a long time. Um, and that's the, uh, used to be called Fat Man's Misery, and now they're calling it um, Helmet's Crack, named after one of the geologists that uh, did work with Thatcher. And this is the crack you have to go down to get down to the, the cave. And so it took quite a bit of work to carry the, uh, the steel beams for the gate down to the cave. It was an amusing exercise. Um, and then it was welded on site in the cave. Uh, and that's because of the fact that this would be on a, a major trail where many people go and we needed to make sure that this was not disturbed. At one time, Hale's cave had close to 20,000 bats in it. Um, with white nose syndrome, the numbers dropped to about 350. It has been increasing in, in the last few years though. So we had to do something about it. We also gated this past year, um, a cave on Chimney Mountain called Eagle Cave. Um, and here are the steel beams where we cut them down by the highway. And then they had to be transported by truck and carried up the side of Chimney Mountain to Eagle Cave. This was our longest beam. These beams weigh 10 pounds per foot. So this was 18 feet long. Um, so it was it was quite the job. Uh, and then again, it was welded in place. Um, and that cave had a gate on it, which is open from May 1st to October 1st, so that it can allow visitation to the cave, but it's locked by the New York State DEC uh, from October 1st to May 1st. Um, and this is a, a allows for teamwork between um, agencies, consulting con companies, um, volunteers, uh, and allows for a lot of uh, a lot of skilled volunteers. Um, and then of course, this was an interesting case because it was a um, it was paid for by a wind company 
that was looking for um, environmental offsets. Uh, environmental offset, because they wind wind weather uh, excuse me wind equipment kills bats, and they kill I don't know how many a year depending on on where they are and what mountains they're on, but they paid for this for environmental offset which allowed a private company that Mike and I have worked for a couple of times to come in, they're top notch, they really know what they're doing, and they build these gates in place so that they fit really well. Okay. So ongoing white nose syndrome is something that was found in New York State in 19, excuse me, 2006. Um, Mike and I were actually sad enough to be some of the first people to see it. We received a call from New York State DEC and they asked us to go to a cave that's about three and a half miles from our house because somebody had reported that there were bats hanging in the sunlight uh, and it was about 15 degrees out and um, they were not they were not acting correctly. And we went there and found all these bats hanging in the sunlight on the just outside of the cave. Um, and there were raccoon tracks below them. They were, it was like the raccoons were going to McDonald's. They were just reaching up, grabbing bats and eating them. Um, and at which point uh, we hoped that whatever it was would go away. And the next year we found it at four major caves, including Hales Cave in Thatcher Park and then at caves owned by the National Speleological Society and Northeastern Cave Conservancy. Uh, and uh, hundreds and hundreds of bodies, dead bodies, partially eaten by raccoons and various other things are found outside of each of these caves. Um, and the number of, of bats dropped from 16,000 uh, at Hales um, down to two years later, 14, and then lower, um, Gage's Cave, which is across the street from our house, from 1,000 down to 88, and the most recent surveys we've done have only had 36 bats. Um, same thing with Skahari and Knox Cave. Uh, these fairly large numbers, um, 2,000 down to 361. Uh, so we have these declines, and the decline numbers are actually higher than that now. Um, Indiana bats in New York State are something like 99% decline since pre-2006. Um, the uh, tricolor bat is down 99%. Um, big brown bats were slightly luckier. They're only, only at 88% decline since, since this time period. And here is a, a map of where the um, white nose symbol, uh, syndrome um, transported from ground zero in Schoharie County to uh, around the countryside in 2014. And it now is, Mike didn't get a, wasn't able to find the, the most recent map, but it's now all over the entire country um, and has affected bats. It, it affects the hibernating bats, reduces their ability to fight off infection, and um, then they don't survive the winter. They wake up in the middle of winter and go out and die in the snow quite often. So there's a great deal of variety of bats in the Northeast, but there are, as I said, 1,424 species in the world. Um, and there are, we have the, the pre, pretty much the least variety of, of most regions, uh, though we do have both the migrating and hibernating bats. Um, in many regions we have, uh, there are also pollinators and bats that eat a wide range of things. Um, in, in this desert Southwest, there's a, the pallid bat that eats scorpions. Um, most of our bats are, uh, all of our bats are insect eaters um, and can do a really good job of, of eating insects in the, in the region. 
And there you see um, what you were asking about how the bats act. Here we have one that that's on his hand, ready to be released and sitting there calmly and will take off when he's ready. So just remember that bats are so gnarly. Um, let's go back now. Okay. And that was a tiny bit short, but oh, we have plenty of time for, for questions. We, we tend not to do too long a talk after dinner because we know people are a little more uh, relaxed at that point. So do, do you want to feed us uh, questions? Yeah, or do you want to read off the... I'll, um, I'll feed you a question. This one's been sitting there for a bit, but I didn't want to interrupt you. Um, sure. For asks, how do I know if the bats that are in my attic are the migrating kind or the hibernating kind? And if they're the hibernating kind, is it possible to exude them without harming them? This is probably one of our most common questions and it, it can be answered in a couple of, of ways. First of all, they're almost certainly uh, hibernating um, and they should clear out of your attic in the winter. Uh, if you have an older home, there are two ways to go about this. One is any time from now on, go up in the attic and find every single little hole and fill it, um, caulk it, uh, use insulation. And you may find that next summer they're still there and you have to do it all over again. Uh, another trick is to, if, if you can find it, set off any kind of a smoke device in the attic and go outside and look where the smoke is coming from. You need to do this when the barometric pressure is changing. I never remember whether it's higher or lower. So it's sucking it out of the house. So the barometric pressure should be dropping outside. That'll suck air out of your house. So you can find all the smoke spots. We did this with friends of ours in town in Schoharie and they were able to block most of the spots but still found that they had bats that were living between the ceiling and the roof joists um, and eventually had to um, pay about $4,000 to, uh, what's the name of the company? One of the critter companies that advertises on TV. Um, exclude the To exclude the bats. It can be very expensive if your house is older, but we really do advise it. Um, they're wonderful animals. They can live in my barn, but I don't want them in my house. They're wild animals, they have parasites, <coughs> they, their urine and feces is not very good for you. Um, well, I see a, a bunch of other questions popping up about white nose syndrome, and uh, we can actually address uh, uh, several of those, I, I think. Yep. Um, if, if that's okay. But yes, there are ways to exclude the bats that will not, not kill the bats, but it really has to be done largely in winter. Great, thank you. Yeah, so white nose um, syndrome, lots and lots of questions around that. Mike, if you can see the questions, I can- Yeah, let me run through. Okay. Well, I'm looking at, I'm looking at the antifungal treatment. Yeah. That was one that was tried and they sprayed an antifungal agent inside a cave um, and release some bats in there. It eventually killed the bats. If you imagine trying to um, treat for something that's sort of pervasive in those environments and the places bats go, you quickly can realize that's sort of a mission impossible to remove uh, a fungus from the environment. And, and, and that, that is the cause of it. It's a known fungus uh, identified in Europe and other places that migrated somehow or other to the United States and unfortunately spreads between the bats extraordinarily, extraordinarily well. Um, so they, they know the cause of white nose syndrome, but they do not, there is no 
you can treat an individual bat, but you can't treat the population it is a big problem. Uh, and, and also because it's not, um, it's a fungus, so you don't really develop immunity to it. I mean, you have to almost evolve or change your behavior away from uh, things that make you susceptible to the fungus. And that's very different than developing immunity from exposure. But actually they're seeing some small signs that this is happening. Um, and also it affects different species differently. So I saw a question about extirpation of bats in the area. That's very much a, a real, real concern. And it may have already come close to happening with the Indiana bat yeah. and small footed bat. Yeah. There's not much hope for those bats in this area at this time or for the foreseeable future. But as, as we showed, there are um, different types of bats in the environment. And so um, woodland bats or big brown bats eventually may become more common as their role in the, that niche in the environment uh, you know, ex may expand. It's, it's an ongoing situation and it's not as simple as saying the bats will be fine or the bats will all go away. There's definitely changes that have happened and will continue to happen. We're not going to lose all bats, but some of the species are very much in trouble. Um, we have seen a slight increase in populations in caves um, and mines that have been protected, but it's a small increase. Um, let's see, we have a uh, question about acoustic equipment. Yeah, let's well, let me do the other one first. It's okay. really quick. This one's pretty fast. Uh, the materials used to control mice, does it bother bats? No, because they don't, they're not ground feeders. So it's not going to do that. The one thing that is disastrous is um, fly strips and glue traps of any kind. Uh, there have been uh, quite a few rehabbers who post on some of the Facebook pages we look at where bats have flown into the fly paper, get stuck and can't get loose. Um, don't ever put fly paper anywhere where bats could fly. Um, if you're using it in, in you know, uh, some area that you're not gonna get bats, it seems like a reasonable method of trying to catch flies, but uh, the mouse traps are not gonna bother bats. Now, as far as tracking devices, it really depends on how the, the bat and how long it stays on. For some bats, it'll stay on for a very long time. It's used a surgical glue, so it doesn't disturb the bats they blow the hair out of the way and glue it right to the skin. Um, but we've also found in some species that do group grooming, and we found this when we were doing research in Fiji, the, the bats that we were working with heavily group groom. And the, the one bat would, would groom the tracking device off of the bat next to it. Um, and we lost a number of tracking devices in this giant guano pile uh, that we tracked. We tracked the bats to the pile of guano um, and found the tracking devices in the guano um, because they groom them off. But most of our bats in this area don't do that and, and they can stay on for as much as six months. Um, and Acu acoustic equipment is pretty ex expensive, except for there have been some layperson devices that fit onto iPhones uh, that are um, under $200. And you can at least see the, uh, see the device, see the information um, and get some, um, some information off of it as far as what species you're seeing. Um, I also have some old ones that just allow you to hear the calls, but don't ID what the bats are. And those are great to use when I do bat walks with kids just so that they can hear the sound of the uh, device. A question about, you know, I mentioned that, um, you know, bats would in fact have to, rather than gain resistance, change their behavior um, or evolve away from being affected by white nose syndrome. Um, there, there's um, difference between bats in the epidermis 
and and they've done some studies that show um, that bats with basically thicker skin or a certain type of skin aren't as affected as much, not as likely to be disturbed by the fungus. So that could be that sort of thing, and that's a little bit uh, speculative, but that's a pretty pretty good example of the idea that bats could, you know, through natural selection, become less affected over time. But it, it's not resistance, really. It's it's evolution. There's there's one other evolutionary um, observation that we've we've had, uh, and that is that the bats that tend to roost very close to each other seem to be more affected by white nose because they seem to pass it on to each other more easily. So the species that are solitary roosters um, have had a little better luck, though for some odd reason, that's not the case with the tricolor bat, which is a solo rooster. Fungus related to warming of the climate. That was an early theory, but uh, Repeat that so that, okay. that yeah. I have a question, that, and this was a, a question that cropped up in everybody's mind initially, was this a warming climate uh, issue? And some people were very adamant about that, particularly before uh, the situation became more fully understood. And the short answer to that is, is no, the climate's actually, um, and they do a lot of temperature studies in caves, in, in the bats environment, there, there has been no significant change. And in fact, the fungus that, that causes this is a cold loving fungus. So it, it thrives in an environment where the bats actually turn off their immune system. They go into cold storage and can be in a very low power mode when nothing is trying to get them. And suddenly there was something in the environment that loved the, that, that grew very well in the cold temperatures of caves and attacked the bats. So it's a little more um, specific than uh, just a climate change. Yeah, it was interesting. When the first studies were done on this fungus, they tried to grow it the way, way all fungus is, is grown in a lab, and that's to put it in a moist, warm environment. And it wasn't until apparently par partially by mistake or just as an offhand try, they they did a, um, a study where they put the fungus in a cold environment and that's where it grew best. Um, American bat pollinators or no, because they're insectivorous. Um, there are about, I think it's 40 species of US bat. There may have been one new one that I don't know about, but, and we have the lesser long nose bat, which uh, pollinates in the cigarro cactus in, in Arizona area. Um, other than that, our bats are all insectivorous. Uh, and, but even that varies because the pallid bat, which is in the desert southwest, eats scorpions and ground insects. It actually lands on the ground and creeps up on, on ground insects. Um, most of the rest of our bats are, are uh, catching their insects in flight. I had a question about wind, wind turbines and tree bats. Yes, the tree bats are quite vulnerable to uh, being killed by uh, wind turbines. And um, also during the migration period, it's especially bad. Um, they fly at a certain level and apparently the sound we haven't got the, the full information on this, but the sound of the turbines attracts the bats and they actually fly into the blades. Uh, um, and well, it's at a certain speed that that happens. Yeah, the interesting thing about birds, bats and wind turbines is that birds will uh, run into wind turbines, whether they're moving or stationary. Basically, they're just flying along and bam. Bats will not run into stationary wind turbines. They're used to evading objects. They have, you know, tools in the dark to, to deal with that. And they will go around a stationary wind turbine. But it's this low speed uh, that tends to somehow attract them and bring them into, and they don't actually have to strike the turbine because there's so much um, combustion of the air uh, turbulence of the air from the, the blade that it can actually uh, destroy the bats when they just get too close to one of these things. So their curiosity 
may or may not kill the cat, but it apparently kills bats pretty effectively. They, they're doing some research on whether or not they, um, when, the, when the turbines are not going fast enough to collect energy, whether or not they, um, feather, the they feather the blades. And if the blades are feathered, there's less bat uh, um, damage. Um, now, er earlier in this ongoing situation with wind turbines, there was a little more hope for that technique. But the problem is that the wind turbines have been getting more and more efficient. So the, the companies that are running them are less and less inclined to uh, block out this low rotation mode because they're getting more and more energy out of slower and slower, you know, moving tur turbines. So they, there's, it's costing them more to consider the bats. So they kind of hoping the problem just goes away. They do some environmental offsets, but it's still a real problem. Um, how far will our local bats travel to reach their hibernation area? Well, they will go quite far south, Florida, Tennessee, Georgia, um, they can, they can go a thousand miles of Mexican free tails will go from, uh, Texas down into deep into Mexico. And they do return to the same roosts every year. There was a bat in Hale's cave that had, uh, was, uh, I think it's called pied. It's a partial al albinism. Um, it had a big white spot on it. And it would be found roosting in the same spot year after year in Hale's Cave when the counts were done. Um, so yeah, they they do have some um, uh, habitat uh, fidelity. Fidelity, yeah. thank you. So, I'll just also, same questions about um, habitat loss, and that's uh, I mean that's I think that's concern of every species of everything in the world yeah. and particularly for bats where that's been a, a, an action item is for the, uh, the long-eared bat, which is a federally endangered species or species of concern. I think it's actually endangered. Um, and their habitat is broadly woodlands. So this has become uh, kind of a friction point between the f anything forest industry and the, the conservationists and the, and the federal regulatory folks is, um, you know, identifying exactly what will impact these species and how to define what is habitat loss. It could be a very, very broad brush. Um, so yeah, habitat loss is a concern for bats, unfortunately, as well as for all of us. What should you do if you find a bat on the ground during the day? Well, any wild animal out during the day, um, just sort of wandering around, uh, you have to assume is ill. Uh, it could have been caught by a cat. It could have been, um, it, it could have uh, white nose syndrome, um, but it's a mammal. And so all mammals, you need to make sure that you do not touch them. Um, if I find, a, I, Mike and I have both had uh, a pre-rabies series because we handle bats, but you don't want to handle them if you want to pick it up with leather gloves and, or a shovel or a rake or something of that type and move it into the woods, that's fine. Um, if you know a rehabber in your area um, and you can get it into a cardboard box and take it to a rehabber, they can take care of it, but there are very specific laws on what the rehabbers can and can't do nowadays. And uh, I mean, a very small percentage of bats are actually rabid, but unfortunately a bat on the ground during the day is a really big red flag that that's a very sick bat. So it's a, if you're ever going to encounter a rabid bat uh, on the ground in the middle of the day is uh, li no. likely what is, is going to happen. The, the, the nice thing is that, that rabid bats don't attack people. Whereas we have had a neighbor around here that had a rabid fox come running out of the woods and grab her in the leg. Um, the, the bats pretty much just go off and die. Uh, so it's not, as, it's not as disastrous, but you just have to always assume that 
any mammal that is not acting appropriately may be ill. So the question is, uh, do bats and their conservation issues attract public attention or is lack of funding and interest a concern? Um, this has been um, modern historically uh, a big issue for bats because of the Halloween association, the reputation. Bats are dark in dark places and mysterious people don't know as much about bats. There's not been as much publicity about bats compared to other animals. And that's, this is a big reason that bat conservation was founded and had, has had some considerable success over the years. Um, bat Conservation International um, has spent a lot of time and effort trying to educate the general public. And uh, I think their biggest success story was probably the Congress Avenue Bridge in Austin, Texas. When it was built, the gaps, the expansion gaps in the bridge were just the right size for bats to roost in. And at first, the people in Austin were petrified and upset and wanted the bats exterminated. And a gentleman by the name of, <laughs> a gentleman by the name of Merlin Tuttle moved from Minneapolis <coughs> to Austin and started Bat Conservation International and turned Austin into the bat city and became um, Austin became a place where tourists actually reserved tables at the, the hotels facing the, the bridge. Um, the tables near the windows during the summer months are reserved way ahead of time. Uh, and there'll be large numbers of tourists under the bridge. Um, and then they have docents who come from Bat Conservation International and, uh, and talk to people at the bridge about the bats. Um, so it's, it's better, but you still have a, a, a real problem because health departments have to still have the idea that, and tell people if a bat's in your house and it's touched anyone, they need to go get a rabies shot or they need to capture the bat and it needs to be killed and tested. And that's all true. Um, it, you really can't take a chance because only two people have ever survived rabies and I believe both of them um, may not have wanted to by the time they survived it. Uh, I think they had some such long-term health problems that they never have been released from a hospital setting. Um, so you can't play with it, but treat bats like any wild animal um, enjoy them in their own habitat, and um, you do want to, to exclude them from houses. Uh, did we miss any? Uh, did you notice any questions that we skipped over or that, or that you'd like to throw in? Oh, there's one that just came in. Okay. What oh, can the average person, yeah, and this is what oh, I, yes, there, I'm, there okay. was quite a lot of concern in the community. What can we do? Is there anything that we can we can do with white nose um, syndrome to help there, out? There really isn't that much to do other than what the Rensselaer Plateau Alliance is already doing, which is protect land that has trees and and water and and um, protect the habitats that are available to a wide range of animals. Um, bat boxes. Bat boxes can work. Uh, you really want to make sure you get one that has been uh, vetted by Bat Conservation International and um, because some of the ones made by folks who have not looked at the research don't build them well. They have to have very tiny gap between the pieces of wood. Bats like to be in very tight places. Um, the roofs have to be in our area painted black. They need to be hung in open areas facing out. And if you already have a farm barn, um, the bats probably won't move. I won't bother putting up bat boxes on my property. They're very happy in my barn. Um, and they're not going to leave. Uh, I mean, I, I have to throw down 
uh, plastic tarps under the roosts during the summer months um, to collect the guano uh, so that it doesn't soak into the boards and smell all, all year long. Um, but bat boxes have worked and can work. Oftentimes you have to put them up, take them down two years later and move them to someplace else and eventually the bats may find them. One of the other things to do is if you have bat guano, you can rub it on the inside of the box, um, obviously with plastic gloves on and it, it'll give it a scent already so that the, the bats are attracted to it a little bit more. Uh, so we know a lot of people who've put up boxes and had them be successful. So the question uh, came just came in, what kind of bats in our barn? And we have the, the pretty much the same flavor of bats that most barns in this area have, which is a big brown bat. They, they're most adapted to structures uh, by far compared to any other species in the area. Uh, so that's, I won't say yeah, that's- they're, they're, they're known as, as house, I mean, we, we removed from two from a neighbor's house once that were up in their attic. They were selling the house and didn't really want the bats there when, when people came to look for the house. And we moved them, um, put them in our barn. And two days later, they were back in the attic of our friend's house. They liked that attic. That's home and that's where they wanted to be. Now, a little more information about bat roosts is, is that there are different types of roosts that will have different kinds of numbers in, in them. Uh, the, and maternity roosts tend to be ex exclusively female bats and pups and that can be pretty much a, like a fixed location. Uh, there are other um, types of roosts, male bats in particular will um, have as a survival strategy have several favorite roosts. Could be an old tree, uh, could be a roost of opportunity because of suddenly bad weather. They do not like to fly in the, the wind and rain. Uh, so if a tree goes down, they've got some some other home figured out. Uh, it also may help them vary their, their feeding areas. So uh, roots, bats do use temporary roosts during the night uh, where they will come in and chill for a while between rounds of feeding. And then they have, of course, their uh, day roost, which is their, you know, their, their sleeping quarters. So uh, in the summertime, uh, feeding bats will have more than one roost. Uh, it's not random, you know, it'll be specific locations they've picked out, but they do move around. Yeah. So one last question, how small can a small colony of bats be? I don't know if there's a thou shalt be more than seven and then be a colony rule or not. Uh, to me, a colony has always been a number of bats together, but I don't know if there's a threshold if it's more than- I don't know. If I saw only two or three, I'd probably think it was just a, a temporary roost. That's a couple of bats. It's a that, couple of bats, yeah. not a colony. Um, but I don't know what number I would consider over uh, to be a colony. That's a good question. Never been asked that one before. So we're at 8.01. Yay. If anyone has any last question, otherwise I think we'll wrap this up. Well, I, I have to say, judging by the number of great questions we had that uh, people were at least interested in the topic and I hope we managed to do it justice. Great, it was wonderful. And you're getting some appreciation in the chat. Yep. Thanks Thank everybody you. for joining and Emily and Mike for the wonderful presentation. And I hope that we get to visit with you again. Maybe we can talk about uh, protected caves someday. Yeah, that sounds great. All right, well, good night, everyone. Thanks again for joining. Thank you, Emily. Thank you, Mike. We'll see you next time. Good night. Night. Thank you. Thank you. Leave.